It's nice to see such a big crowd here tonight. On behalf of the Trinidad Historical, Trinidad Historical Society, we're happy you came. We have a very interesting program in store for you this evening. Ken Fletcher is in town, as he has been the last two or three years. He came here to look at trolleys, and he, he's never left. I don't know why. He's our expert on rap. And this evening, he's going to talk about a specific rap, rap building, one that we're all interested in, and that's the Fox Theater, or the West Theater, as it was once known. Ken, I'm not going to go into your biography. You've been here before. Come on up. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Before we begin, I'll give you a little upfront about this. Kent McKinney, who is the assistant professor of the media department of this college, was the man who filmed it. And I found out after it was all done, uh, it's damn difficult to follow the producer when you don't have a script. We didn't have a script, as I don't have tonight. I never do have one. I just extemporaneous go off in the blue. But he did a marvelous job of following me around. And I was attached to his camera with a mic, and I was a little worried if I turned a little bit too fast or something, I'd pull the camera out of his hand, or the mic would go flying. But we did fine. Uh, one thing that you'll see in the video, now, although we heard him very succinctly with our ears, ears pick up very well, Mike was down on the stage. I had the mic with me because I was with the cameraman and we were up on the second balcony, the gallery. Mike got on the stage and he's like Marcel Marceau. Mm -hmm. We tried to turn his volume up as high as we could do, but he comes out about like this. So when he comes on, when he's on the stage, you aren't going to hear much. I may have to throw in a little bit uh, as it is. I dedicated this to Sal and Marie Sawoya because, because of their tenacity, that building probably would have been closed years ago and wouldn't even be around anymore. So it's still showing movies seven days a week uh, if you come. If you don't come, he's still there, Mike is. But uh, seven days a week that theater is still, which says a lot for this little town because big cities don't have a theater this size for the most part anymore. Uh, the Paramount, I don't know in Denver how many it seats, but it doesn't have a second balcony. Ours does. It's the only one in Colorado that does. It's a little worn on the edges, but you would be too if you were approaching 100 years old. So with further ado, the lights are going to go down, and we're going to show the video, and then I'm going to come back and bore the heck out of you with some more stuff about the theater. Today's program for the Trinidad Historical Society is going to be devoted to the West Theater, now called the Fox. The program is dedicated to Sal and Marie Savoya, who are responsible for having this theater open to this day in 2004. We're at the corner of Animus and Maine, and we're looking at a building that was constructed in 1888-89 for Ed West, Bulger and Rapper, the designers. Ed West, who was born in Jefferson City, Missouri in 1847, left home at the age of 15 after the death of his parents, and he drove an ox team to California. We don't know what happened out there, but we do know that he arrived in Trinidad in 1868 and with William Mosby Elmore began a sheep ranch at Delhi. In 1904, Ed West was one of those who proposed a new opera house that would have been located at the northwest corner of Maine and Animus. That's where the Crest Cleaners is today. His first efforts didn't prove successful. Between 1888 and 1907, there were 11 different proposals for the construction of a new opera house in Trinidad, although we still had an opera house built by the Jaffa brothers over at Commercial in Maine that was still in operation. In 1906, that building was closed, the opera house was closed, and in late 1906, early 1907, Ed West finally got his act together and had the Rapp brothers design what today is known as the Fox, but back then was called West's Opera House. 
and also a little bit later, West Theater. The original construction began in February 1907 and was completed and opened, the building was opened on March 16, 1908 with the stage production of The Bondman. The ballroom in the basement opened in May 20th of 1908. Total cost of the theater in 1908 was $125,000. Charles M. Campbell was the superintendent of construction and J. E. Laughlin was the contractor. Silent movies were introduced around 1910 and the first talking picture, The Voice of the City, opened on April 30th, 1929. In September of 1925, a Wurlitzer Hope Jones theater organ was installed. It continued to be used on and off until 1938. The building itself represents the use of over two million bricks and 12 carloads of Portland cement. Well, we've come down onto Main Street from across the street, and we're gonna wander down the block and take a look, or I'll let you know, what happened in this area when Ed West had that theater built. This was known as the resort area. Most of the buildings constructed in this area had shops on the first floor or bars and saloons, and upstairs, rooms rented by the hour. In fact, this area was noted for what historians used to call people that practice the oldest profession on the face of the earth. So come on along with me, and we're going to walk down. And if Kent McKinney, who's doing the photography here, will look up across the way, above the CNM shop, those were some of the places where rooms were by the hour. And further down the street, above the Maloff grocery store, those were also rooms by the hour. This whole area, known as the resort area, was peopled with the soil doves and their customers. If Mike can point up there and get a little bit of that sign, it says Hausman Drug Company, Drugs and Sodas. And this was People's Drugstore. And above that, which is almost obliterated, it says West's Theater. This is where the drugstore was located and where Have a Bite had their little restaurant. On the other side was located early on a saloon, but that was closed and it became the offices for the theater. The marquee was not originally on this building. That was put up in 1935 because more and more movies were being shown inside this building. Now we're going to come along and we're going to be Mike Haydad, who's the manager of this theater for his aunts, Marie and Sally Sawoya. We're inside the lobby at the West Theater, and we're looking at a few posters that were put together by yours truly for the people to read when they're, before they watch the movies that are in force here during the day. The posters are in the old boiler room on the wall, and we had seen the girl from Mums up there, which is in pretty good shape. And there are other posters for the Rose Maid, the Rosary, and Shepherd of the Hills. But we didn't know the year that these were performed. In the newspaper one day, I came across the girl from Mums, the poster, in the newspaper, and it said blatantly in 1913, that's when these plays were being held on the stage of the West Theater. Also, another thing that would be of interest to the people of the town, David Levy was born here in Trinidad in 1903. The family moved to the state of Washington, and he got his uh, degrees at Washington State, and then moved on to New York, where he was in a few plays in Greenwich Village. He changed his name to David Lewis, went to Hollywood, and became an assistant to, to Irving Thalberg at MGM. He became a producer uh, of several movies during his lifetime, and some of the movie stars that he was involved with while producing were Gene Harlow, Greta Garbo, Betty Davis, he did four movies with Betty, and then also with Orson Welles and Claudette Colbert, Ingrid Bergman, and the second to last of his movies in 1957 was with Montgomery Clift, Elizabeth Taylor, and 
East St. Rain Tree County. So we do have a Hollywood connection in Trinidad. Now I'm going to turn it over to my K dad who manages the theater for his aunts Marie and Sal Savoya. Mike, it's all yours. Thanks, Ken. Um, I've always thought that this theater is a remarkable exercise in form and function that has its positive and its negative features. The positive feature is that everything works together to create an auditorium, a lobby well suited to live performance or to movie exhibition. But the flip side of that is that the building really does not admit of any major modification without destroying the aesthetic of the building. So as we go through this outer lobby into the major lobby, um, you can see stairways leading up to the second balcony or so-called uh, gallery. And then as we move further in, we can see the stairway up to the first balcony. Um, prior to about, uh, well, I don't know at what point, prior to 1929, the arches that you see filled in there were open down to the wainscoting. When the place was remodeled for talking pictures in 29, those arches were filled in. And at some later point, a snack bar was added. But because the building was not designed for a snack bar, the snack bar can only extend out so far without impeding traffic. We're in the projection booth at the Fox. Um, this room was actually metal clad because in earlier days the film was quite flammable. Um, the technology, while it's changed, has not changed in its essentials much from the earlier days. Uh, what you have essentially is a light source, a projector, which allows light to go through the film in such a fashion that uh, it's, it's shut off, light shut off while the film is in motion, and then light passing through the film as the film uh, stays stationary. A, a means of delivering the film to the projector and then on a lower platter a means of picking the film back up. Um, earlier technology instead of taking a movie and putting it on a single program delivered the film in 18 minute reels which were used on alternative uh, projectors. You would have a projector station here a second projection station alongside and every 18 minutes the operator would be shifting from one to the other and back again showing the program reel by reel. Well Kent and I just climbed to Mount Kilimanjaro. We're up here in the second gallery, second balcony which was called the gallery of the theater. It's wood seats with wooden partitions between the seats uh, it was the cheap seats back when this was performing live performances on the stage. Now we're looking down into the theater from this very tall auditorium. In fact, if you sat way at the back in the gallery, you'd be approximately five stories high over the stage. Uh, this would be a great place to view Hitchcock's vertigo uh, and... Uh, also, there was never really a chandelier in this auditorium, mainly because it would have blocked off people's view that were sitting up here in the gallery. There are four boxes, and we can see a couple of them fairly close that has the lattice work on them. Originally, they were where people would spend a few more bucks to watch the live performance. And in 1925, those grills were added, and that's where the pipes for the theater organ were located. And the theater organ played from 1925 on and off until 1938. And before microphones were available, everything had to be through projection, the human voice. Mike, do you want to quote something from Shakespeare or Ogden Nash? But don't sing, please, because you're not Italian. Oh, you in the auditorium, you have an unimpeded view of the proscenium arch. And some folks have said to me that they think the sound in the second balcony is actually superior to the first. Not too surprising, because as the articles in the Chronicle indicate, the sound is amplified and projected by this arc, goes, goes cold.
kind of French horn shaped pendentives on the side and then up onto that sounding board up above you. So you actually are, for sound, probably in the best seats of the house. Thanks, Mike. Kent and I are now on the stage of the West Theater or the Fox, and he's shooting up into the second gallery. What's really impressive when you look at this building from the stage is that it is not a very deep auditorium, but it sure is a very tall auditorium. Uh, we have the boxes to either side showing the lattice work where, as I said earlier, the organ pipes were located. Uh, this design that we're seeing inside is called Rococo. Uh, French Renaissance is, it was very big at the time this theater was constructed. Uh, I'm very impressed and always have been impressed when I first came into this theater because in Colorado there is no other theater in existence that has two auditoriums. And some people have said, although I can't prove it, that this is probably the longest running open theater in the state. It really never has been closed since it opened in March of 1908. There were periods where it was shut down for a week or so while they did major, major alterations or painting. But for the most part, this baby has been open almost 100 years. In 1959, it was purchased by John, Marie, and Sal Savoya and thank God for them that they did purchase this theater because if it hadn't been for their tenacity to keep this place open, it probably would have disappeared many, many years ago. So Trinidad has something to be very proud of because this is, represents its architectural heritage. It's a wrap and wrap building. But thanks to Ed West and the present owners, we have something that would be a shame to lose. Well, we're backstage on the main floor of the stage at the Fox or the West as time demands. You've already seen a hint of the lighting board. That lighting panel still is in use for turning on the auditorium and various lights within the building. Uh, we have only one painted set up in the wings. You can see a bit of it from here. Uh, I don't know how far back that dates. In all likelihood, it has to precede the 1929 uh, move to talking pictures, and it may conceivably even reach back to the uh, opening years of live performance. That first catwalk is at about 35 feet up. It's the same height, amazingly enough, as the top of the arch of the auditorium. And if you look straight up, you see the bottom of the rigging loft, which is 71 feet above stage level, high enough to pull sets fully out of sight without any rolling or folding. You can see a rung ladder on the wall of the stage leading up to the first catwalk. And then from that first catwalk, there's a very steep staircase that leads with a single landing up to the rigging loft. On the wall opposite the uh, staircase is the rigging, which is still in place. Uh, it hasn't been disturbed for a goodly number of years. Uh, you can see the ropes there. I have been told by one gentleman that this obviously was a hemp house and that it took a real pro to balance sets with that kind of rigging and to raise and lower. And there, finally, is a shot of the uh, counterweights help to balance the sets. There are two loading docks on the back side of the building, one up above the other, one, the larger one here for the main floor, and a smaller dock uh, immediately below it. Um, contrary to popular fiction, there are no tunnels in which railway cars were lowered into the building, but I do believe that uh, there may have been a railway spur at some point. We're on the west side of the Fox Theater, looking at it, uh, the original Fox Theater signs that were put up in, in about 1952 or thereabouts. And then we're going to pan up and look at the mark on the side of the theater that says West Theater. 
it's still very distinctive. If you'll notice to the back, that back wall is 110 feet from the bottom down by Safeway all the way to the top. Incidentally, while this building was being constructed in a year and one month, there was only one fatality. Lee Simpson fell 35 feet from the back stage down to the uncompleted stage floor. He happened to be the grandson of the man who Simpson's Rest is named after. You'll also notice that there are fire escapes that lead from the main floor, the first balcony, and also the second balcony. And there are also ladders that go all the way up to the top of the building. Well, folks, that ends our feature for today. The popcorn is gone, the concession stand is closed, and another day ends at the West Fox Theater. I'd like to dispel a few rumors before we're completely finished with our little program. There has been, some people have said that there are period costumes down in the basement from when this theater was performing live. That's not true. Also, there is not a cache of silent movies in the basement. Those would have been long ago taken by anybody who ventured through this theater. The other thing is that there was not a tunnel for railroad cars to come up here and bring the props when this theater was operating live. There were carriages and transfer companies that were pulled by horses and mules that delivered the props, etc., to the back of the theater, and they were hoisted up into the various areas of the theater by gantry. Well, folks, I hope you've enjoyed this actual tour. This hasn't been a virtual one, but an actual one of Trinidad's major theater. See you next time. Bye. Felt like a little like Siskel and Ebert there. <laughs> but I didn't say the balcony was closed, just the concession stand. Um, again, I want to thank Kent McKinney because he really had to put up with a lot to follow me around and get these shots without a script. Uh, you do need them. I mean, well, this isn't Hollywood, but damn close by some ways, thanks to David Levy. This is an original shot of the building as it looked after it had been built. Uh, things had changed. We don't know, I don't know exactly the year when the front facade on the street side was changed. Uh, probably, I'd guess, in the 40s uh, when the People's Drugstore and Havabite were gone and when the saloon was changed into uh, their offices. Uh, I never heard of Quaker made rye, but I don't think I'd like it. Uh, but again, those signs. West's Theater and Hausman Drugs, Drugs and Chemicals, that's still on the building. So good old, uh, what was the stuff they used to paint with that were not lead paint? It, it held up. Well, I got to get behind here and punch. This is an early shot of the interior. And when Mike was talking about when those arches were open to the wainscoting, you can actually see through and there's the stairway that goes up to the first balcony. So this is the way the theater looked fresh, uh, with probably just a couple of years' use, if at, if at that much. Next one. Now this is when the marquee was put on, the west, and the drugstore is here, and I believe that may still be a bar. Uh, I'm not really sure, because there's no name on it. Uh, it may already have been turned into the uh, offices for the theater. But again, it's a very impressive building. Next. Now, notice the arches have been covered. We've got the grill work for the uh, theater organ. We don't know exactly where the theater organ was placed. It wasn't in a pit. Some large cities, Denver is one, they would raise out of a, the basement or whatever, trap doors would open. This one didn't have that feature, as we can tell, but it might have sat down there just below the floodlights. Next. No, they sat up front. Now we're going to get involved with some of the people that actually were in the theater or were attached to it in some ways or another. This lady originally was Mary Harris. She was born in Ireland in the town of Cork, her family moved to Canada. Eventually, she came to the United States. 
She married a gentleman by the name of George Jones. They had four children, and unfortunately, because of yellow fever, she lost her husband and the four children. That little lady, and I say little, and that's not being derogatory, she was about five foot. She had politicians and owners of coal mines and sweatshops terrified. She had a brogue, and she knew how to use it, along with some rough words that we would think today are nothing like hell and damn. But back then, that was a no-no. Um, she was for the downtrodden and those people that were taken advantage of. She came to Ca uh, Colorado a couple of times, the first strike, 1904, 03, 04, but she really came here in 1913, and she spoke at the West. They said she generated 1,500 people into that auditorium to hear her. And then they put her into San Rafael Hospital, or yes, she was supposedly sick. She wasn't sick, they were. Uh, next one. Ah, somehow the papers took upon themselves to say that this little girl was from Trinidad. Her story is quite complex. I've got a stack of newspaper clippings, well, on Xerox, about an inch thick, about this little girl. Uh, she was born in Denver, and she was either a foster child or an adopted child to the Osbournes, who did come eventually to Trinidad. The father ran the Isis Theater on commercial. Yes, there was an Isis Theater on commercial at one time. He ran it for about a year. He also worked for the Chronicle News in advertising and also for a period of time at the Advertiser. Um, the mother, or stepmother, foster mother, she was also a performing artist on the stage. They took this little girl to California and she became a hit almost immediately. The producer at Balboa Studios in Long Beach saw her, said that's the one for me. The first movie she appeared in, of course, this is Silence, the first movie she appeared in was as a little boy. They had a page boy cut back then, and she's got part of it there. And she looked like a little boy in the, in the movie. But then the director, producer, and owner of the uh, Balboa Studios wrote a film specifically for her called Little Marie Sunshine. That picture was shown at the West and I've got to look at my notes for the dates because my head is so crammed with stuff. Um, let's see. March 19th, 1916, Little Mary Sunshine was shown at the West Theater. Uh, she never appeared on the stage there, but a month, le a week later, she appeared at the Strand over on Commercial Live with one of her other movies. They turned those movies out week after week back then and they would stay at a theater for two days and you'd get a new film the next day. They really were in a production line. There's another picture of her with a little, and I'm sure that's not a lie, it looks like a little cheetah or something, but uh, she stayed into film till she was about 13 years old. And then uh, things went bad, went good, went bad, and I don't know if the lady is still alive. Uh, I think she was born in that one I don't have. I think it's about 1903, or no, it had to be later. Uh, but she may still be alive out in Hollywood at uh, one of the places they have for the retired people that were in movies. Next. Ah, does anybody know who this is? Who's, who's going to guess at who this is? Oh, he put it up there. Oh, shoot. Well, we know, we know who Sousa was. He was a band leader. And uh, he came to the West Theater and performed on stage with his orchestra band uh, three times over a few years. His first time was November of 1925, and that was his first appearance. And then there were two more in a couple of years later. Next. Ah, well, he put the name. I was going to ask you, I guess who they were. Don't look. God Bless America, do you remember the song? Very. That's right. I remember Kate as a kid uh, on the radio. She had a radio program. She was very, very popular. She was kind of hefty, I guess the word would be. Well, 
They had contests at the West to draw people in. In the 1920s, if you were to sit down and read through the newspapers for the 1920s, you'd see that our economy was taking a dive. I don't think anybody in Washington was paying attention. And then in 1930, it really took a dive, and we had the Depression. But things were not that great in 1920s. The theater was doing everything possible to draw people to the movies. And they'd have contests. They had a ukulele contest. They had a milking cow contest on the stage. Uh, but the one that really drew my attention, and I know it's not politically correct completely to do things anymore, but I don't like to rewrite history. And when you're politically correct, you do have a tendency to rewrite history. Now, there are some things that were done back then and said that I don't agree with. I think they should be left out. But this <clears throat> Fat Ladies Contest that was held at the West was in conjunction with Kate Smith's first movie. And the write-up in the paper, now it was done with fun. The ladies weren't thinking evil about this. They went and they entered. The, the folks came to watch who was going to win the prizes, and the prizes were going to be tickets to Kate Smith's movie. Uh, the comment was that heavy ladies, 212 pounds and over, come to Fox West Theater today. This is February 18, 1933. We skipped up to the 33. It said, if you are feminine and fat, here's something to smile over. Trinidad women are invited to be guests of the Chronicle News and the Fox West Managements at the first showing of Kate Smith's initial feature movie, Hello Everybody, Saturday and Sunday. But in order to see the show free, you must weigh 212 pounds or more. Uh, this you see is Kate's weight. I don't know how tall Kate was, but I don't imagine she was a very tall woman. But she was, she had a great voice and she could project, she could probably just snake, uh, shake the snow off the mountains over here at Sangre de Cristo. Uh, so if you are feminine and weigh 212 or more, you are invited to attend the show at the Fox. The scales will be in the lobby of the theater. <laughs> Secure your weight card and see if you can crash the gate. Uh, the contest was held, and on February 20th, they said 9,838 pounds a feminine weight qualified at Fox West Theater <laughs> over weekend. Heftiest lady was 296 pounds. It says the parade of the fat ladies was seen at the Fox West Theater on Saturday and Sunday. The weighing machine which manager Ernst had made available at the theater entrance ticked off a total of 9,838 pounds of feminine poultritude. <laughs> Confined to those heavily constructed ladies, who became eligible for the free admission. The heaviest at the beam was 296 pounds, whatever that means. And uh, they had a loser. She only weighed 205. Well, you, know, you lose some, you, you gain some. So much added weight was given to the seating floors at the West Theater over the weekend that manager Ernst had a building foundation inspected. <laughs> He was looking for a sag somewhere. I'm quoting. <laughs> but it was all in fun, and I'm sure the people enjoyed it. And uh, later on, Kate came back to town. She didn't come to the West, unfortunately. She was going to do a radio program from the West. The train was delayed, and she did it at the Cardenas Hotel, which unfortunately is gone, as this lady was who had a tremendous voice. Uh, more things that they do in the 30s. Now they're really hurting for business, all right? They've got to do everything in their power to draw the people to the theater. And someone hit upon an idea of giving away some money. If you bought your ticket, came into the theater and were present, and they would draw the ticket out, and they'd call the number, and if you had it, you got the money. If the person wasn't there that night, they'd roll the money over, add to it, to the next Thursday. They did this on Thursday night. And it was originally called Prosperity Night, and it started with $50 cash given away every Thursday. That was big money back then. 
you can't get anything at Wally World for 50 bucks now. Uh, then they had a live baby giveaway. Honest to God, a real live baby. It happened to be a little porker, a little baby pig. They gave it away, but it drew people in to get that baby pig. They had a coloring contest where the kids would color certain aspects of whatever they, they didn't mention what they were doing, coloring. But guess who one of the winners was in March of 1934? Marie Savoya. In that while, she became the owner of the theater, one of them. Uh, in 1935, in September, Fred Marriott, who was born here, gave a concert on the theater organ. He was organist and carolinist at the Rockefeller Memorial Chapel at the University of Chicago. He came back home and gave performances at our theater. Uh, we can have another next one, please. Well, they put Roy Rogers there, but I think you can read this, Happy Trails, Roy Rogers. He actually came to Trinidad. One of his pictures was at the theater, and uh, it was called Colorado, and they had the premiere here, and Rogers came on stage. They didn't mention if, if uh, his horse came with him, but uh, he did perform, or he did stand on the stage at the, at the Fox by that time, West Fox. Next one. Oh, I could have stumped you with this one if you didn't put that smiley burnett up there. Uh, Roy was here in September 1940. February of 1941, Smiley Burnett, who was the sidekick to who? Very good. Who else? Is there prompting in here something? Uh, he came here and appeared on stage and did a little song and dance, Western style, for the movie Riding on a Rainbow, which he performed with, or, uh, with uh, Gene Autry. Uh, next. Pat O'Brien. He didn't make it on stage, unfortunately. Uh, this was in March 26, 1942. And it was the first world premiere that was at our theater. It was called Two Yanks in Trinidad. Not Trinidad here. Mm -hmm. Trinidad, the island nation north of South America. But the war was going on. All right? He was in Hollywood and they piped in his voice over the, over the telephone lines to the theater to talk to the audience, along with his co-star, Brian Dunleavy. So Pat's voice at least covered the theater, if not in body. Next. Yes, I thought his hat would disappear because when I copied it, it was a little bit rough. Uh, Jimmy Dean. Oh, I had a hard time finding his picture. It was all sausage, and I thought, no, we can't do that. <coughs> he came here uh, in 1989 for the world premiere of Big Bad John. I guess the movie wasn't really that great, from what I understand. But at least we had another world premiere. Uh, I believe Sal this time was in, uh, greeted him, Sal Savoya. And uh, they had quite a party, and a good time was had by all. I think that should do it on the slides. Uh, just a few more extemporaneous comments. I've heard people say that the Fox should be turned back into a performing arts. I can't agree with that statement because it would take so much money for one to get that theater adapted back to something that's access accessible and, and also the people would take it that are the performers, because the rooms for the actors and actresses, which are below the stage, are in, oh, they put up with anything back then. They're just plywood walls and a little light bulb hanging from the ceiling. Also, we do have a performing arts theater at another rap building, just 17 miles south of us at Raton. We don't have the population here to support something like two theaters, uh, let alone one. And even Denver has a big problem with the small theaters trying to stay alive with live performance. And they've got too many people up there. Uh, so I, I really don't think that it should be changed. It would be a shame to lose it as a theater because it's great to go into this huge auditorium and see the way pictures were presented back 30, 40 years ago. 
we still can do that. So live performance, we've got a place right here and we have an auditorium at the high school, the old high school, which is now junior high, which is an auditorium built by the Raps. So if anybody else wants to try and ask me a question, I may give you an answer. Yes, sir. Yes, John put it up there. He never connected it. I think he died before it was finished. But yes, uh, that could, with a few dollars, because he painted the brick black behind it, which would have to be washed off with chemicals. But it could be removed, but I don't know if that will happen anytime soon. Uh, but uh, it was used, it was going to be used for solar. Yes, ma'am. What happened to the organ? Oh, great question. I talked to. Sam Piazza, who used to run the theater in the projection booth, and I asked him if he knew, he lives at Walsenburg, I said, do you know what happened to the organ at the theater? He said he thought it was sold to the Mormon church in Alamosa. I contacted them and they said no, they had, didn't have it. Uh, I don't know what happened to it. Uh, everything is gone with the exception of a few pieces in where the pipes were, but the rest is, maybe it's in somebody's basement, you know Trinidad. Uh, <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, you, you didn't go into the basement. Uh, is no. there a ballroom there? Yes, and the ballroom, I, Michael, kill me. I've been there. It's used for storage now. But the, it's not the grandiose idea that you get from the big cities that had mirrors and chandeliers and all that. Uh, it couldn't have chandeliers because the uh, ceiling is about as tall as this ceiling here. So if there were chandeliers, you'd run into them. Incidentally, Jimmy Boyle and his orchestra performed at that ballroom. And I think Jimmy Boyle is uh, a relative of somebody that's here in the audience somewhere. Isn't that Jamie Sue Gillardi's dad? Uh -huh. He performed on, on the stage in the ballroom. Did I see a hand? I was going to ask about the ballroom. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's used for storage now. And it, it wasn't anything special. It was just a room to dance in. No oh. mirrors. Yes, ma'am picture there's is it a billboard or there's so much stuff that's on to the right of the uh, those are billboards yeah before that uh, there was a battery company to begin with and now it's a real estate office there wasn't anything there that's right originally West wanted to put it at the corner in 1904 he didn't get the funds to build it and then the gas station was built well that was much later but he decided to build a little closer to the resort area <laughs> <laughs> was, was the building built with those two storefronts in the front, or was the building, was the theater built behind the, the drugstore and the other store? There's that 16 foot wide, 40 foot long lobby. Either side were the two storerooms, the drugstore and the saloon, and then you went into the the main auditorium. Are they a part of the building oh, yes. or were they there? Oh, no, 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 no. No, they that's are, all part of the building. They are part of the building. Mm -hmm. yep. a little bit of rent coming in there. Then. They had some rent, yes. Yes, sir. Um, are we in danger of losing the Fox as a theater? If we lose Sal and Marie, that's a question. Because they don't make any money in that building at all, believe me. And then since we had our rates go up for the heating, mm -hmm. ugh. Uh, they haven't made money on that theater for years, but because they're hard-nosed Lebanesers, that theater is still alive, and I, I really applaud them for keeping it open, because most of us, if any of us, would keep a building open that's not bringing in any money at all. Yes, ma'am. Did Sorry. the Enterprise uh, turn a profit from the old was built? At what, $125,000? That's big money back in 1908. I don't know what that would convert. We have a banker here in the audience. What does that convert to, Ralph? Guesstimate for today. No, 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 no. What would that money be worth today? Has you got an answer? Ooh, I got it. $11 million? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good sum. And uh, thanks to Ed West, he put up most of that money. He made it on sheep, but uh, it's there, thank God, still but today. did it run as a profit? 
I don't, they didn't put that, no, no, never went into receivership. But I don't know what their figures were, they never put it in the paper. And those records were in the company and those are gone long ago. Uh, the original people that ran it and then the Fox West uh, conglomeration that ran it as a theater and then the Savoy's bought it in 1959. So I don't know what the, what, how much they made and for how long. But when videos came out and television, that was the downward slump. Anybody else? Nope. So well, it, it was a performing arts theater up until movies came in about 1930. No. Uh, for about two years, it was just performing. Then in 1910, they started showing silent oh, pictures. Silent. So that what they would do is they'd have something going on mm -hmm. live, and then they would show some silent movies also in the program. And that was mainly to compete with the little Nickelodeons that were all over the place here in town. We had about eight of them at one time. So they had to compete. And then as the movies got better and better in silence also, that was starting to take over from what was originally there as far as performing arts. And then by the time the movies began to talk, they would at times have uh, vaudeville come in little bit traveling troops but they weren't hitting the small towns anymore they were going to the big cities because the small towns couldn't afford it anymore they didn't have the audience well, oh. those pictures in the back of the stage the, you showed the bottom part of what our scenery that used to come down it's a backdrop yeah, yep to whatever was being played there at the time and that's the only one there there's just one and I'm surprised it's still up there because Mike mentioned it was a hemp house. Well, what he meant by that is the rope was made out of hemp. And I believe most of the hemp came out of the Yucatan Peninsula way back. And that was used to make rope. And it's a very, very strong rope. It has to be for being up there for at least 50 years or more. Any more? Yes, sir. Did Sewell Barker used to play the musical score there? Yes, very much so on the organ. Yes. They also had, before the organ was installed, they had pianos that would accompany the silent movies. And they usually had scripts, well not scripts, but uh, what do we call it when we put the music on it? Well anyway, they would have music with different moods to portray the mood that was going on on the film, uh, whether it was a chase or whatever. They would have those pieces of music there and they would go along with it, as the organist would do later on. Backdrops where they painted on canvas, were those huge canvases? Yes. Yeah. And they're huge. And that's why that back is so tall. Instead of rolling them up or folding, it went straight up without a fold. And what was the population to accommodate three working theaters at one time? Uh, I understood that correctly. Well, there were more than three. There were about eight little theaters in town, Nickelodeons. And some of them also had performances too. The Crystal was the first one opened in, I think, and I stretch my memory, I think 1904, the Crystal Open, which is approximately where Miners Park is now, in one of those buildings. What kind of a population? Uh, between 10 and 15,000, in the town. Then you had the mining communities around it, so you up that for another maybe 10,000, 5 to 10,000. So you had a pretty good population here. Yeah. And they had interurban service that came into town from the coal camps, of Starkville, Sopris, and Cokedale. Uh, so there, and there was a city trolley that would take people downtown. So it was, uh, you didn't have to walk to town, you could catch the trolley uh, until 1923. And that went out, and then the cars and buses, we had buses too. Uh, I think it was a dollar and a quarter for on the first level, it was more in the boxes, and the cheap seats were the gallery, and that was like 50 cents or a quarter, depending on what was being played. They didn't have popcorn then. There was no concession stand. That didn't come until the talkies. Yes, sir. Yes. You worked at the drugstore? No. Oh. No, no, but they had a doorway between the drugstore and the entrance. Still do. But not before when they had live performances. Before, no, when the movies were on, yes. Movies, yeah. yeah. But live performance, no. Oh, there was a shooting there also. 
in the lobby. Uh, yes, two miners that had uh, didn't disagree with me, or they they didn't agree with one another. Uh, let's see when that took place. Scared the hell out of the people that were in the lobby. <laughs> It cleared the lobby, it didn't clear the theater. Uh, I don't have it written down here when that happened, but it was early and uh, no one was killed. Thank goodness, there was an injury, but uh, no one was killed. Uh, lots Did we of... have a bullet hole in the wall, perhaps? No. It was a bullet hole in the person. <laughs> he aimed well. Uh, I don't have the date on here when that happened. Incidentally, Jimmy Boyle was appearing there in September of 1926 with his eight-piece novelty dance band. Uh, are we... Oh, we're still going. We're almost reaching an hour. Yes, ma'am. Um, it's my understanding there are a lot of the old movie posters somewhere in the basement or in the building. There are some posters, but they're not old. They go from about the time when the Savoyas possibly when the Savoy's took over. But I know there are probably some there from the, uh, oh, at least since Mike's been there, he doesn't throw anything away. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know how far back they go. I haven't seen any myself. But there may be some may, uh, from the 80s, 90s, uh, but nothing real old, not, not from the silent film. There's nothing there from the silent era at all. That's all gone. I think most of it was cleared out in 59 when the building was sold to the Savoyas. Those that owned it took it with them to another theater or just trashed it. Yes, sir. How many would it hold with everybody sitting down? You know, well, said, Brother Jones had 1,100 people. 1,500. She everybody had. with a seat? Well, I mean, no. There was a uh, standing room only when she was there. Yeah. We were built a little smaller back then, too. We weren't as wide. But That's not offensive. Well, 1,200 people could go in there, seated. Yes, <clears throat> originally. But then when they made the seats a little bit larger uh, and they changed them, they don't have that much capacity anymore. And if they sat in the gallery up on the second one, oh, you didn't breathe much. No. Well, thank you very much. We've actually done an hour. And for next time there's a great movie and you want to watch, come out to the Fox and watch it. <laughs> what a resource he is. He always gives such a good program. Uh, I hope you'll all come back next month, third Thursday. We're going to have another program. We may not be real sure yet what it's going to be, but there is going to be a program on the third Thursday of next month. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>